Welcome back to Raising the Flipping Bar. So excited to have you back. We've actually got Steve Pilkington on a second episode, and this one went so well that we wanted to create a second episode for you to get so much more knowledge and information. So make sure you jump in and tune into the first episode. This one, we're going to dive into the Denver real estate market, and we're going to talk about some great resources that you can use as takeaways to help grow your business. Also, we talk a little bit about a couple of things we've got going on with, do we feel that there's the value there as it relates to college and real estate? So let's jump on into today. Today's episode. Welcome to Raising the Flipping Bar, the go-to podcast for aspiring and seasoned real estate investors. I'm your host, Derek Marlin, and I'm the CEO of Elevation. We're a real estate investment company based right here in Denver, Colorado. We'll dive into smart investment strategies, market insights, and essential tips for scaling your real estate ventures. Whether you're making your first investment or your hundredth investment, this podcast is your blueprint for success in the ever-evolving world of real estate investing. Get ready to elevate your real estate game and begin your journey with me. Let's talk about what is on everybody's mind is the NAR settlement, the mm-hmm. National Association of Realtors. Is Again, this is kind of mid Q2. So we're in between the shock and awe of it happening and it actually getting implemented. So there's going to be some changes. But in general, what was your takeaway on that settlement? And more importantly, how are you and your team just maybe modifying your business to succeed here with the new reality from July on? Yeah, fantastic question. So first of all, I think everybody in real estate needs to have a time where you work with somebody and then you continue working with them and then they buy or sell a property without you. I had that happen with somebody from a leads group. I legitimately showed her over a hundred properties over the course of like a year, year and a half. And then she walked into an open house and went under contract on that open house um, because the agent convinced her if she didn't do it right then and there for the short sale, that she wouldn't get it. And fast forward, she didn't even end up getting the property, but I missed out because I didn't have a buyer broker agreement in place. I was just shopping with friends because it's easy to shop with friends. Like it's a lot easier to sit down with somebody and be like, let's go look at properties. Everyone loves that. That happened in 2009, pretty early in my uh, real estate career. So I've been adamant about sitting down and doing a buyer broker agreement with my clients. And because we always search for off-market properties, we have to have in there that the buyer is responsible for the commission. Otherwise, we can't negotiate it in the contract. So when NAR announced this, I kind of chuckled because in my mind, it's going to get rid of a lot of the, the, what I lovingly call the mercenaries in real estate who like, they're like, oh, neighbor, you're going to sell your property. Well, let me activate my license again and I'll help you. Yeah. No one would do that if you were getting like a surgery or if you're going through like a major legal battle and you would always want a professional who is very professional. I'm, I also work commercial real estate and have for years. And in the commercial world, like the largest deal I ever submitted an offer on was $34 million and they were offering exactly zero commission. It was when multifamily was really hot and they didn't have to offer any commission. And so back in 2019, 2020, I was already working with people saying, hey, here's a breakout of based on the price point. This is what you're going to owe me. I'm going to do everything I can to go after this money. Yet this is what you're going to owe me. The reason you're going to owe it to me is because here's all the services we're going to do for you. If we get on the same page, awesome. What's funny is as a real estate broker, we are one of two people or one of two industries holding out there where you only get paid if everything goes the way the client wants, or at least the client agrees to it. And then they sign off on a product. The only other industry that does that is class action lawsuit attorneys. As brokers, we make on average two to 3% per deal. Class action lawsuit attorney makes 25 to 60% of whatever they win. So like Frank Azar, he spends 20, 30 million on marketing a year and makes well over a hundred million on cases of a couple hundred million they do for their clients. And so this is what I tell people out there. Systematize your value and really present it to people over and over again. Don't do it in the form of a just a waterfall. Just piecemeal it out over and over. Give them something and then tell them what's next. We are in the business of next. Our value is helping people get comfortable and understand what's coming next. So the more you can document all of that and then give it to people in a way where they can digest it, the more likely they are to really see your value and then actually want to work with you and refer you to other people, even if it means that they're coming out of pocket to pay you. And then the final piece of that is make sure you understand how they can pay you if the seller refuses to. There's very few scenarios where a broker can't negotiate that payment in. And so make sure you know those scenarios. Hint, low income, down payment assistance, builders offering nothing. It's really hard to get paid on those. Um, But for the most part, you can negotiate that in. So from my stance on this, this is an opportunity for those of us who are professionals to get a leg up 
This is an opportunity for those who are not professionals to figure out their true passion in life outside of real estate. I do think the only downside to this is that I do think that there are going to be a lot of folks out there that feel empowered to do it on their own and end up having a very negative experience. I bet you in the next 12, 24 months, we're going to see a lot more lawsuits happening. Historically, at least I think this is, if I remember Damian Cox correctly, he's one of the heads of the contract board for Colorado. He said that about 90% of all real estate transaction related lawsuits are from single representation where one person, whether it was the person being represented or the other person not being represented, they felt uh, like they got wronged. We don't allow dual representation. So you either have to represent one and treat the other one as a customer, or you can do a transaction broker where you represent the transaction. Make sure you're super clear on what that means for your people and then follow it. Yeah, no, I think that's really well said. And you're right. There's so many industries between tax, between law and between finance that people wouldn't do all this work and then be like, oh, I hope everything works out and I hope you pay me and I have no idea what we're going to do. Or yeah, it's almost like, well, let me just, let's just look at some stocks together. Yeah. Like you would never do that. But yeah. for some reason in real estate, it just was the way that it was. Yeah. I remember meeting with an architect who was very blatant about you are so overpaid for your services. He was talking about all the work they go through as an architect. And I asked him, I was like, well, help me understand. How are you paid? And he goes, well, we get one third up front when they say, when they secure us because we do a lot of work. I was like, okay, so you get paid a third of your revenue up front just to start working on the product. And he's like, yeah. And then he goes and we get paid one third when they break ground, when we have a, a finished architectural product. And then we get the last one third when they're finishing the property. I was like, so you're getting paid all the way along the way. And then at that point, I was like, I will give you the discount you're asking for. You just owe me a third of it today. And then you owe the next third of it the day we write an offer. And then the final third, the day we close. He was like, well, that's ridiculous. And I was like, yeah, no, I think that's so. really well said. And you're right. There's so many industries between tax, between law and between finance that people wouldn't do all this work and then be like, oh, I hope everything works out and I hope you pay me and I have no idea what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. Or yeah, it's, it's almost like, well, let me just, let's just look at some stocks together. Yeah. Like you would never do that. Yeah. For some reason in real estate, it just was the way that it was. Yeah. That's what you just said. Help me understand. Yeah. Help me bridge the gap. And I think hopefully people will really take away that I was always blown away from the traditional real estate because, again, I always come in as the crazy investor, the dude that doesn't even have a license anyways. And I was always I was I admired it and I almost felt bad of the amount of time certain agents would spend running buyers around looking at anything and everything, especially in the super hot market. To your point, either a things not working or just not valuing your time. And so in general, you need to weed out the people that you probably shouldn't be working with anyways. It's like anything. But you're right. It's going to take this kind of forced action to make sure that people do what they should have been doing from step one. Yeah, 100%. You could probably do an entire podcast on figuring out the people you shouldn't be working with. Because yeah, well, so often I know in my experience, and my team members experience, it's you start and you invest a certain amount of time. Like I had one of these last year, it, it was a client who had used me three times before, yet he still would go to every family member, friend, coworker for their advice, and then come back to me with, well, did you know this? Or I don't know if I want to do this because this, he just didn't trust, even though we had worked with them on several other properties. And nothing was good enough for him. I walked him through, this is what the market can do. If the property has been on the market for two or three days, we can't go in 10% lower. It's just, it's a waste of our time, especially when they're nice. If it's distressed, that's so different, which also you had a really good one about negotiating properties down. It's great. So that client, I should have just let that client know, you know what? Like, I appreciate you as a person. We are, may not be a fit for this yes. because the additional 20 to 30 hours I spent with him before we ended up parting ways anyway, I guarantee I could have found one, two, three more clients in that time that would have paid me five or 10 times what I would have gotten paid on that $300,000 purchase. Yeah. yeah, no, that's so. really well said. While we're still kind of on the topic of Denver real estate, mm -hmm. and I love how you brought up some of those very good takeaways that people should go back and listen to of where maybe to not spend your, your time and energy on a, a certain flip. Is there a certain area of Denver that you feel like is a good value for a fix and flip right now in our current environment? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I look at areas that are good value is I do want to see that there's a, a enough of a difference between the high and the low in the neighborhood to be able to justify the work that you're putting into it. Um, and in my mind, that means you're either going into some luxury areas where you're going to land in that 1.2 million plus as a finished product, or else you're looking in um, like you're going to be renovating a 2000 square foot or less property. Because um, the likelihood of you going upside down on that from a material cost, from finding other things out is a lot less. And a lot of those neighborhoods are the ones where you might be able to acquire property for 300,000 and then resell it for 550 after doing a $80,000 renovation on it. The luxury ones, the reason I bring those ones up is that the luxury market's selling really well right now. It blows my mind how many people are paying cash for properties over $2 million, even how many cash buyers I've seen in like the Wash Park area that are like a $1.7 million home. So providing somebody with the convenience of a really move-in ready house 
um, there's buyers for those right now. You just have to big caveat that though, is that if it's on a busy street, just don't do it right now. If there's something like that, that you can't control, if you're staring at like, I just saw a property that I thought could be a great opportunity. The house right behind it had one of those like giant power stations where it looked like one of the guys from Tron and you can hear it like buzzing out there. That's just a lot of risk in my opinion. The only property right now that we're having trouble selling backs to 112th. And it's a beautiful condo that one of my, one of my clients, uh, he was referred to me, he had already flipped it when I met him because that road noise, folks are just looking elsewhere. And even though we're priced better than the last sales in the neighborhood, they're still finding better deals on other stuff in Westminster right now. Yeah. So that's what I would say. Look for stuff. That's like, you're really appealing to that, like 400 to $750,000 finished product. Otherwise you're getting into that more luxury space. So we're going to take a quick break and tell you about the next Elevation Academy. If you're looking to dive deep into real estate investing, this is definitely the event for you. Our academy features over a hundred step process to help you navigate every single thing from market analysis all the way down to every aspect of project management. So this is tailored for both beginners and seasoned investors. And our one day intensive training will equip you with the strategies and insights needed to elevate your real estate investing game. Spots are definitely limited. So click on the link below in the show notes to sign up and transform your approach to real estate investment. Okay, let's get back to the episode. Luxury for you is about 2 million plus. That's kind of your, yeah, your it, cut off roughly. But yeah. It, it, but when I look at like from a flipping standpoint, I almost consider like luxury on the flipping is I'm landing at like 1.25 million or above. Okay. Yeah. So even though with a buyer buying, like there's, because most of the properties that I flip like that, they've been in areas where it's like, that might be Inglewood, Greenwood Village area that had, have had some downtown, but like nowadays, like you can be in Wash Park and $1.1 million is the cost you pay before you scrape the house so you can build up. So I want to talk about something about that we've kind of gotten common that I don't think a lot of our guests have. I think to me, it's really important and it's really about real estate as an industry and where we're going. So we both have kids that are in high school. Would you want your kids to work in real estate either A, when they come out of high school or B, when they come out of college? So that's an awesome question. I think the best way I can describe this is I was driving my 15 year old, my freshman to a soccer game. This was beginning of the year after Michigan had just won the championship. And she was saying, I think I might want to go to Michigan because they're like an Ivy league school, but it's not Ivy league. You can pay a lot less costs. And I was like, well, you can. And my brother-in-law went there, but I think it would still cost us about 75 to $85,000 a yeah. year. At that time, we were about to drive past DU. And then she's like, well, why don't I'll just go to DU then? And I was like, $85,000 a year. And then she was like, well, maybe I go where you went to Pepperdine. I was like, well, one of my best friends just took his kid there. That's a hundred to 120,000 a year now. She's like, I can't believe it's all so expensive. And I was like, it is. I did an exercise with her on, let's say you graduate with $300,000 in debt. Let's say mom and dad don't pay all of it. And we put a certain amount up and you graduate with that debt. And I was like, or if I just gave you $300,000 and we invested it in a really good investment property, whether in Colorado or in some other area, and then you looked at the cash flow you earned from that. And the exercise was how much money do you have to earn after college to be able to pay off your student loans, let alone invest in a property and other things, versus if you just put that money into an investment now, learned why you're doing it, and then how much further ahead you'd be. So the moral of the story is like, I got a great education because in part I got really good grades and I was really poor. I got great scholarships. My kids aren't going to have that poor piece going for them. They're very intelligent, but so is so many people now. There's so many brilliant folks out there. The number of people that get like a perfect SAT or ACT is insane. So you really got to dive in like Gary Vaynerchuk says, are you leaning into the thing you want to do and spending more time learning what actually gives you energy? So for kids getting into real estate, Every one of them in some aspect is going to have knowledge of it. And I probably am going to encourage some of them to get their real estate license, even if they're not full-time because some of the benefits they can have from that. Also, I'm heavily going to be encouraging them to let's really focus on what you want to do before you start spending money and time and effort doing it. And whether that means you're going to go get free internships somewhere, you're going to go actually spend time doing the things that you think you want to do, which some of that might be a challenge. My daughter wants to do like marine biology, like we can go plant her with some friends in Southern California or something, but right. just to figure out, like, don't get yourself really upside down on debt with the goal of getting out of it. Go into it with the mindset that your debt is going to be very purposeful. The same, you and I use debt on a regular basis and there's an end goal every time we do it. The same has to be said for student loans. Like when I did it, I was just pulling out as much as money as I could because I was living in Malibu, couldn't afford it. I was a poor kid around kids that legitimately had like 
fancy Mustang GTs. One of my friends drove a Ferrari in, in college. So I would just take out extra loans just to pay for food. Right. And that was stupid. It was absolutely stupid. My encouragement to them is there are so many ways you can make money with real estate, whether you're going to go to college or not. In fact, one of my friends at Pepperdine, she and her family had bought a condo at Pepperdine. And this is in 1996, 97. And she paid $390,000 for it. Stayed there for five years, went all the way through school. Then she moved back to Seattle and sold it for $1.4 million. Wow. And so that paid for obviously all of her schooling and then some, and it was not, everyone's going to have that opportunity out there yet. Whatever you can do to house hack while you're in college, do so. If you're going to go to college, whatever you can do, there's a lot of programs out there where you can go to a two-year school and have a guaranteed entrance to a really high-end four-year school if you keep up your grades at a certain level. I mean, because I have a bunch of friends who went to two years of community college, one year somewhere else, and their diploma says Pepperdine just like mine does. No, I think that's really well said. And I really try to focus in on leverage versus debt. And yeah. debt, a lot of times, yeah. can be that personal debt. And it's funny because when we teach our academy, the number one thing that we hit right out of the gate is getting your financial house in order. You have to get your personal financial house in order and then your professional financial house in order. And then if yeah, you, you're coming out and you've got three or 400 grand in debt, and unless you're going into investment banking or going to be an attorney or maybe a doctor, I actually say maybe because you normally you don't start making money until you're in your 40s. Mm -hmm. You're almost screwed. You know, I think that's interesting because I think we run in some similar circles where I feel like it's the parent's badge of honor to say Johnny or Janie is going to X school that I don't know if they can stroke that check anyways. They're putting themselves in a rough spot or maybe you're putting your kiddo in a rough spot. And, and you said it perfectly. How much better off are you to have that than truly an elite Ivy League education versus going to a CU, CSU? You know, we're in my kid is my oldest is looking in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Just stuff that you can get the WUI scholarship for. Like he's not that piece of paper is not going to get him that job or he might change his mind nine times anyways on what he wants to, to do. But it's like the parents thing of like, oh, my kid's going to Notre Dame. Well, to your point, yeah, can you afford a hundred grand a year? And then that kid turns around and wants to be a content creator anyways, or an elementary education teacher. You've screwed yourself. I, I don't know why, but I think some of it is sadly like the parental badge of honor. I think it is. I think it is. I think a lot of people out there have this idea that if, if they do something, then they'll get something instead of just doing the thing that they want anyway. So it's like, there was this quote that I learned a long time ago, which was be, do, have, or like be the person you want to be do the things you're supposed to do, then you're going to have the things. And most of the time people want to do, they want to do something, have something. And then when they have a certain thing, then they're going to feel like they're, they've become this person. And same with real estate investing, the number of agents I've spoken to that said that they really want to get into it. But then when given the opportunity to go shadow a flip that's happening and show up twice a week to inspect it and see what's going on, talk to contractors and see what's going on, learn in the process. It's amazing how many of them are like, oh no, I'm not going to do any of that until I find my own property. I'm not going to even bother like trying to find a property because I don't have the money to do my own flip now. So I'm not going to try and find a great deal that I can sell to somebody else or partner with somebody else on. It's like people do this backwards where just start taking the actions on it. Just start doing the activities. Um, and then so the, there's a, a fantastic book called Outliers, yeah. Malcolm Gladwell. And he really talks about how the people that have succeeded overnight, like Bill Gates and technology, well, it's because he started doing playing on computers in, in high school 10 years earlier. But when it showed up, by the time he actually had time to perform, he wasn't practicing on game day. He's performing on game day where so often, whether it's going to college or whether it's doing flips, people expect to practice on game day and then they wonder why things don't work out so well. Yeah, no, that's really well said. Well, I want to be conscientious for times. So we're yeah. kind of winding down. I'll give you a second to think of one final thought that you want to leave the audience with that maybe we haven't touched on before. But what I've really enjoyed is that I think that some people would actually look at us as competitors. They say, wait, you're both flipping properties. You're both doing investments. You own brokerages or you run teams. But to me, this is the beauty of collaboration, that we can sit down, we can share knowledge, we can pass along this knowledge, we can share deals, we can help one another out. So I just want to say thank you that to me, there's not competition, there's there's 100% collaboration. Absolutely. Um, and, and I'll give you kind of this quick little snippet of, of how that came full circle. And, and one of our company, or really our company mission is to create full circle value and generate wealth for people. You and I have known each other for a while. Mm -hmm. You introduced me to another EXP agent because our team hangs your license at EXP. Yeah. We didn't really know where it would go. This is Craig. Yeah. And so then we just got together. We connected, didn't know where that would go. Try to add value to one another. He has a client that is he's worked with in the past. And he's like, oh, she wants to get into flipping. And 
But to his credit, I get it where if they come into our eco ecosystem, they're like, well, wait, are you going to steal my client? Well, I was like, no, because I got introduced by you. We were happy to train her up. She just took the academy. She was great. And then I made sure to reach back out to Craig to say, hey, she got great training. We're there to help her along the way. But we want to make sure that you know when you're ready to go or when she's ready to go, we want them to list with you. Like to me, that's the value that that you provide and that hopefully the audience gets. I just want to say thank you for doing that. Oh, I appreciate it. I, I came from an environment at one point where there was a lot of collaboration inside the company, but it was almost like this line that everyone outside, it was like the demarcation zone. They're all bad and against us. And I started going to Inman events and some other big, bigger events. Now, most of the mastermind groups that I'm a part of, it doesn't matter what brokerage or even like what business line you're with. And most of my best friends are with other companies. And obviously I want to align as many as possible in my own company, yet that's not going to take away the fact that if I see somebody who's a great individual and I can add value to their world, I know that through like the law of reciprocity, things will come back to me. So whether it's introducing you to other agents that are in your firm, because I got connected with them or anywhere else, like I see so much value there. We play in such a big sandbox and the likelihood that we're going to step on each other's toes is so low. And even if we do, the times that I have, it ends up being kind of a fun like banter or a little com competition thing. Yeah. And I've never been in an environment like that where at the end of it, people aren't high-fiving and being like, oh, good job on getting this one. I guess wrap it up. The things that I would focus on, regardless of what you're in out there, is who are you listening to? Who are you getting content from on a regular basis? I do a daily morning with Brennan Burchard as like this power up. And I've got a lot of different podcasts like yours that I will tune in on so that I can see what people are doing at a high level. Make sure that you're getting content on a regular basis that's uplifting you. Ideally, something that's personal related. A huge believer in everyone doing something for mental health. It's something that's going to empower you on that. And then business, you got to have your mentors. You can't expect that everyone in your world is going to be a, a unicorn and that you can go to the same person to learn like your finances, your family, your business, your faith, your all of that. So look to people that you can identify as a mentor and you don't have to know them in person. It can be through a podcast or a YouTube channel and then commit to them and really look at how you can dive into that. Love it. Um, where can people find more information about you? How do they connect with you? Yeah, absolutely. My team is the Path Home Team. So Path Home and Team, like our goal is to guide people on their path to achieving generational wealth through real estate. So you can find me at Path Home Team. Connect with me on LinkedIn or Instagram. I think on Instagram, mine's uh, Real Coach Steve P. And on LinkedIn, it's just my name, Stephen Pilkington. And uh, happy to help, happy to make any introductions or anything I can. Awesome. Well, Steve, it's been a pleasure. Really appreciate you being a guest and we'll catch you guys on the flip side. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Raising the Flipping Bar. If you found value in our insights and stories, let's keep the conversation going. Connect with me on social media and be sure to share this episode with friends or colleagues who might benefit. Your feedback and reviews help us grow and reach more listeners like you. So please, if you enjoyed this episode, leave us a review. Thanks again to the Elevation Academy for sponsoring today's show. If you're interested in learning more, click the link in the show notes below. And remember, every property tells a story, every deal brings a lesson. Keep reaching for those goals and we'll catch you on the flip side. Hey everybody, thank you so much for listening and watching Raising a Flipping Bar. Just a basic overall disclaimer is that A, this is not legal advice. B, this is not tax advice. C, this is not financial advice. I hope you get the gist, but I'm obviously not a lawyer, not a CPA. Hell, I'm not even a real estate agent, actually. But in general, we hope you get a ton of value out of this. But there is a bit of a disclaimer. Please consult a professional if you have any questions whatsoever. Thanks for tuning in.